the most joyous Jewish religious feast of ancient Israel. This brings forth the image of great joy from within the crowd. These in white robes, who were they, and where did they come from? One of the twenty-four elders explained that these are the persecuted disciples of Jesus. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. In what state were the faithful? They had just come from the great tribulation, the conflict with Satan, and with his instrument, Rome. They were exhausted, ravaged, and broken. But contrary to this image, they appeared as those who were celebrating a victory with joyous feasting. After the intermission, the seventh seal is broken, revealing the remainder of the book and God's divine intentions for the conflict between Rome and his church. The last seal brings forth a new series of sevens, that of the seven trumpets. The Lamb broke the seventh seal, and John saw that seven angels were given seven trumpets. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Each blow of the trumpet served to announce judgment on the enemy, judgment that God would send against the Romans to bring them to repentance. The plagues that would come against the Roman world were sent in response to the prayers of the persecuted saints, proclaiming that God sends his judgment against those who would persecute his people. At the sound of the first trumpet, hail and fire fell upon the earth, forests and vegetation, destroying a third of them. The first trumpet is therefore judgment upon agriculture. The trumpet blasts generally strike one-third of the elements concerned. Notice that the judgment under the seals destroyed a fourth of the elements concerned, whereas here there is an increase to a third. The vice is tightening. The judgments are becoming increasingly more severe, but there is, however, still time to repent. When the second angel sounds his trumpet, a huge mountain is set ablaze and is thrown into the sea, destroying a third of the fish and sh ships and turning a third of the sea into blood. God throws a mighty blow against sin in attacking the shipping industry, which was of great importance to the Romans. The third trumpet is blown, and a star named Wormwood falls on a third of the rivers and springs. A third of the water is poisoned. God has inflicted on the Roman world bitterness and misfortune. At the sound of the fourth trumpet, the heavens are struck. A third of the sun, moon, and stars are wiped out. God will strike the irreligious in order to prevail against their stubborn hearts before it is too late. After the fourth trumpet, John heard from the skies an eagle who said, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, allowing Satan to open the abyss. From the abyss, dark smoke came forth and darkened the sky and brought forth dark clouds. Here we see all of the destructive forces of evil the erring way of lies, immorality, and their decline, which have corroded the hearts of the Roman people. From the smoke came a horde of monstrous locusts, whose mission was to torment the pagan empire. During those days men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. During those days men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. These undoubtedly represent spiritual turmoil, anguish, fear, guilty conscience, remorse, depression, and all the pains of hell which torture sinners and poison their lives. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apollyon. Their meaning, the destroyer, undoubtedly points to Satan himself. God permits his actions in order to bring Satan's victims to repentance, in order that they might be healed. When the sixth trumpet sounds, the order is given to release the four angels who had been chained by the great river Euphrates. Traditionally, this is the place where both the Assyrian and Babylonian armies were used as God's instruments of justice against the faithlessness of Israel. These angels represent the military invasions that would occur against the persecuting empire. 
While moral corruption corroded the empire internally, externally war was raging. The invading army is described in such a way that would make the Romans tremble with fear. The soldier mounts are described as having the heads of lions and tails that resembled serpents, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. An army of 200 million, that is the type of power that God can call upon, enough to defeat even the invincible forces of Rome. This army killed one-third of men, but of those who remained, they refused to repent. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. The plagues brought in by the trumpets had not enticed the Romans to search for the true God. They had nothing but hardened hearts towards their sins and crimes. Before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, there is another intermission. Within this intermission, there are three specific visions. In the first of the three, an angel descends from heaven with a little scroll open in his hand. This scroll contains the rest of the events of Revelation. An order is given that John come, take the book, and eat it. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. The scroll was sweet because it announced the triumph of the church, but at the same time it was bitter because of the suffering that the faithful would have to endure during their conflict with Rome. In the second vision of the intermission, John received a reed with which he measures the sanctuary of the temple. This symbolizes that God will protect that which was measured. John is instructed to leave the external court as well as the holy city unmeasured. God will abandon this place for a time while it is taken over by pagan authorities. What does all this mean? The sanctuary, the external court, the holy city? All of this represents the church, of which the external is left to Rome's discretion. But the Lord protects the internal. In the third vision, we see two witnesses that God has called to preach to the world. The two witnesses meet with violent opposition, but with the strength of miracles they oppose their adversaries. God is saying that the hostility of the Roman Empire cannot prevent the church from preaching the gospel. Finally, a horrifying beast comes up from the abyss to make war against the two witnesses. The beast is the persecuting power of Rome, and for a moment it seems as if he will be victorious over the witness. This victory is fleeting, however. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. In spite of all the blood that was poured out in the Roman arenas, we know that the church of Jesus will not come and last. After the third vision, we come again to the trumpets. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet to signal the triumph of Christ over the empire. We do not yet see the victory come to fruition, but an angel calls from heaven to celebrate by anticipation, as if it had already taken place. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants the prophets and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. The final battle has come, but first John takes a moment to explain the nature of the conflict as well as to explain the identity of those involved. He begins by presenting the opposing force, their commander-in-chief, Satan. He has always been the hostile force ready to fall upon the earth. If Christians were simply a desperate group of religious people finding themselves in the, in the minority, there would be no hope for them against the vast power of the empire. But in reality, the fight was between Rome and the Lamb. Thus, the victory of the church is certain. 
The enemy, who is in reality Satan, is not simply a one-time loser. John sees Satan attack three times, and as many attacks as he throws, he loses. The first vision of defeat opens with the picture of a radiant woman. This woman represents the people of God throughout the ages, being both faithful Israel in the Old Testament, as well as the church in the New Testament. In the vision, the woman is pregnant, and she is going to have a son. But into the sky emerges a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child the moment that it was born. Here, Satan attacks for the first time, trying to take the life of the Christ at the moment when he is the most vulnerable in the flesh. The dragon must, at any price, stop the boy from fulfilling his royal destiny. Throughout his public ministry, Jesus is confronted with obstacles that the devil sends his way, trying desperately to divert his mission. But Jesus took up his cross, carrying it to the end, and by his death he vanquished him who had the power over death, Satan. The dragon failed at the very moment when he thought he had Jesus at his mercy. In God giving his own son into the grip of death, he in reality was paving the way for him to come back to heaven to reign as king of the entire universe. Satan's attack is thwarted, and the son sits down on the throne. God's eternal plan is accomplished. To be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Having failed in his attempts to kill the Christ child, the dragon goes after the woman, in other words, the church. The attacks that Satan lays against it bring about Michael, the archangel's intervention. He is appointed guard for God's people. Michael and his angelic cohorts fight for the cause of the church against Rome's champion, the dragon and his angels. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The image of the battle between the angels and the failure of Satan against the church is the picture that God will never let the demonic powers triumph against his people. Having failed against the child and the woman and against the woman's guardian angel, the dragon returns to fight against the woman herself. He spits from his mouth a river of water in order to drown her, but God intervenes by opening the ground to swallow up the water. Jesus never told his disciples that the powers of hell would not come against the church. For the third time, the dragon, the eternal loser, is defeated in this vision. Full of fury, he decides to fight, not against the church as a whole, but at the churches as individual members, Christians themselves. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. From here, Satan will call forth two beasts that will ally themselves with him. The first beast came forth out of the sea. This beast represents the Roman Empire in regards to its efforts to force the Christians to worship mankind, as well as the empire's persecution of the church. Like the dragon, the first beast had seven heads and ten crowns, that is to say Rome was helping Satan during the time of the church's infancy. We also learn that the seven heads symbolize seven emperors who sat on the Roman throne, Augustine, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian, and Titus. In the vision, the seven heads had written on them blasphemous names, alluding to the divine titles that were applied to the emperors, Beloved 